that's dealing with the spiritual gifts. And uh, we'll read verses uh, 1 through 3, and then we'll dive right into the message. You should have a copy of the lesson. If you don't, if you just slip your hand up, the men will bring that by to you. All right, Laura needs one there. Frank, you can pray in the middle if you can. That'll be good. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and uh, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Uh, ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away under these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand 
that no man speaking by the Spirit of God called Jesus Christ cur a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is a Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Uh, what amazing thing is to know uh, that God gives us clear instruction here about the working of the Holy Spirit in our life. And chapter 12, 13, and 14 uh, is a section that the Apostle Paul will deal with this matter of spiritual gifts, and specifically he will deal with this matter of speaking in tongues. And so these are three good chapters to be able to go through and study. In your notes there, in the introductory introduction, we see that chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians refers to the gifts working in one body. And that is the church. The body he's talking about is the church. And so the spiritual gifts, the gifts that God gives to us, is for the purpose of working within the body of Christ. And then in uh, chapter 13, when we get into that chapter, uh, chapter 13 refers to the gifts as exercise through love. And uh, certainly each one of us have a gift that God has given us. And we minister then to exercise that gift within the one body, the church, uh, because of the love of Christ. And uh, we exercise it based on that love. And then in chapter 14, uh, it refers to the principles that govern the exercise of gifts in public worship. And so the three aspects of these three chapters in dealing with spiritual gifts is the working in one body, the exercising those gifts through love, and also realizing that God is not the author of confusion, so he has principles by which we are to minister to others with the spiritual gifts that God gives us. And it's just not a haphazard, wild free-for-all and saying, oh, well, that's the moving of the Spirit of God, and we're worshiping the Lord. That has nothing to do with it. Uh, there's some inaccurate, I put these in here for you, there's some inaccurate or misleading teachings in respect to the gift of tongues. And uh, usually when you get to chapter 12, 13, and 14 is where people really start to go way off base on their position in tongues. Uh, one position you see there is that uh, there is a baptism of the Spirit after salvation. Uh, now, we know this, the baptism of the Spirit takes place when you get saved. It's not something you experience after you're saved. We're going to be dealing with that and showing you that. But according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, it says, For by one Spirit are you all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made to drink in the one Spirit. So there cannot be multiple baptisms of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's only one Spirit, there's only one body, and there's only one baptism. And uh, there may be many fillings, because Ephesians 5 and 18, Paul says, be not drunk, where we, where in, uh, in is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so multiple fillings, only one baptism. And uh, we are, baptism means to be dipped or immersed or be put into. And so when you trust Christ as your Savior, you're put into the body of Christ at that very moment. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then, uh, um, uh, uh, literally, uh, you are filled by the Holy Spirit as far as the power of God working in us and through us many, many times. And so uh, one falsehood is that there is a baptism of the Spirit after salvation. Uh, letter B is just simply this. The evidence of this baptism is speaking in tongues. So first of all, the, the premise with they're starting with is wrong. Because they're saying there's another baptism. You need to give me baptized of the Spirit of God after you get saved. But then they add to that error by saying, well, you know you're baptized by the Spirit because the evidence is the speaking in tongues, which the Scriptures does not say that at all. And so they're, they're reading in and adding to it. So 
you can see in your notes, the Corinthians were all baptized, but not all spoken tongues. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 20, 20 I mean, so verse 10 says, To another the working of the miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. And so it's not, it's listing different gifts of the spirit that are given to believers in the church but didn't say they all had the same spirit they all had the same gift and then in first in first corinthians 12 and verse 30 paul presents these hypothetical questions have have all the gifts of healing then he just asks the question do all speak with tongues do all interpret and the obvious answer to them was no. And so uh, their premise that the evidence of being baptized with the Spirit of God is speaking in tongues is absolutely false. Uh, John the Baptist was filled with the Spirit from the womb. Uh, we know when uh, Mary met with Elizabeth uh, that she was filled with the Spirit of God. The baby leapt with inside of her womb. Uh, yet John the Baptist is not recorded anywhere of ever speaking in tongues. Uh, in Matthew chapter 11 and 11, it says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of woman, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. And if John the Baptist didn't speak in tongues, then why are we trying to make that a, a uh, declaimer or revealer of the reality of if you have the Spirit of God or not? And so just with that position that the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues has no scriptural foundation to it whatsoever. Amen. Then the next fallacy I put in here, uh, there are those that say the gift of tongues is a mark of spirituality. Uh, the problem, I have a major problem with that because in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, in verse 1, Paul is dealing with the Corinthians and their lack of spirituality. He says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. For I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto uh, uh, ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife, divisions, and are ye not carnal and walk as men? And so, literally, Paul is not speaking to their spirituality because they were carnal. They were fleshly. Yes. But yet now, they, you know, somebody takes the instruction of Paul about spiritual gifts and now wants to say... Well, you know, they spoke in tongues uh, because they spoke in tongues. That's a mark of spirituality. They weren't spiritual at all. So once again, it's a fallacy. The other problem is letter D there. They say that the gift of tongues is for the church today. And uh, I do not limit the ability of God to do whatever he wants. And uh, But the tongues that goes on in churches today is not the tongues that is in the scriptures. Amen. In uh, 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 8, it says, Charity never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether it be tongues, they shall cease. Uh, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And so, to use the premise to say, well, tongues are for the church today. If tongues are for the church today, this is what it would be. It would be me, as an example, who cannot speak any other language except English. And I have trouble doing that. But it would be me going to China and getting ready to preach never studied Chinese, don't know how to speak Chinese, couldn't even begin to comprehend the Chinese language, but stand up and preach, and I would preach clearly in Chinese for them to hear the word of God so they could be saved. That would be spiritual tongues. 
this this foolishness in churches where people are just mumbo jumbo gibberish running around out of control is not for the church it is not evidence of the presence of the spirit of god in producing tongues in the church and so paul says this in verse chapter 13 when that is but uh, when that is perfect is come uh, then he says this, then that which is in part shall be done away. So supernatural prophecies, supernatural knowledge, supernatural speaking in tongues would be done away when that which is perfect is come. Now there are several different ways people interpret that one verse. And they interpret it, some say, well, that means when you get to heaven, you'll be perfect, and so tongues will cease then. But he doesn't say anything about us going to heaven and tongues uh, ceasing to exist. There are those that say, well, that means when Jesus comes, again, then tongues will cease to exist. It doesn't say anything about tongues ceasing when Jesus Christ comes. It simply says when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. So the only thing that it can be pointing to as the ending of tongues is the completion of the scriptures. Okay. The scriptures were not complete. And when Paul was writing this, but when they would be complete, you can see in your notes, uh, the word perfect is from the Greek word talion. It is used in the nominative case, which the nominative case is a linking verb. And so if it's a nominative case, that means the gender of that which is perfect is neuter. The issue is this, if it's in the accusative case, it would either be, it would be singular masculine. But since it's not in the accusative case, it's in the nominative case, it is neuter. So there's only one thing that which is perfect can represent, and that's the Word of God. And when the Word of God was completed, there was no need for, like on the day of Pentecost, when uh, Peter would stand up and preach, 19 different language people would hear him speak in their own tongue, their own language. And so much even beyond that, they said, how hear we every man in our own tongue? And the word used there is the Greek word dialectos. He not only spoke to them in their language, but their very dialect in which their language was. It was a miraculous event that took place and there were 3,000 souls that were saved. But when that which was perfect has come, the Bible, it was no longer necessary to have tongues spoken in a miraculous way because they can open up the Bible and read it. And so I like what W. E. Vine and his expository, expository uh, dictionary of New Testament words wrote this, 1 Corinthians 13.10, is referring to the complete revelation of God's will and ways whether in the completed scriptures or in the hereafter. So he throws that in, which I don't agree with him. But there, it's, it can't be dealing with the hereafter because Paul's not saying when we get to heaven, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And so because of that, then that, that's what's perfect, our complete revelation of who Christ is. He's not talking about that. He's talking about on earth. When that which is perfect has come, it can only mean one thing, and that is the Bible. And so the premise that tongues is for the day is a false narrative. And uh, listen, I've, I've talked with charismatics over the years, and I've gone through basically these, some of these points that I have in this message. And I remember one lady, I mean, she was adamant. She told me, she said, but Michael, you need to realize I know what I did. And I said, well... You know, I don't know what you did. I don't know how you did it. I don't know why you did it. But I can tell you what you did wasn't right. It was wrong. And she, we went through this. I talked to her for about an hour and a half. And she finally, she told me, she said this. 
She said, I can see what you're saying, and I understand what you're saying, but you have to understand, I know what I experienced. And I said, well, that's why John says, brethren, beloved, try, uh, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit to see whether Amen. it's of God. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid there is a spirit that is not the Holy Spirit right. that is directing people to be out of control, uh, spouting out this gibberish, uh, and they, it's not scriptural, spiritual tongues. And so uh, another wrong premise. Then, then the other one I put in here, a wrong uh, theory or position on this matter of tongues, is that there are those that say that uh, a believer can benefit from tongues privately. And uh, uh, the amazing thing is this, tongues, or uh, may I say this, all the spiritual gifts were given for a specific purpose. The spiritual gifts were not for the purpose of self-edification. The spiritual gifts were given for us to be able to minister to others. And so 1 Corinthians 12, in uh, verse 7, Paul tells us this, and we're going to break this all down in a minute. He said, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. In other words, the spiritual gifts that God has given us is not for me to be selfish and saying, I'm profiting by this spiritual gift. No, I'm taking whatever spiritual gift God has given me, I am to exercise it and live it out to the profit of everyone else. We're to minister to others. Speaking in tongues in the scriptures was not for the purpose of man, some individual walking around saying, well, you know, God really spoke to me, and well, I'll tell you what, I'm really a spiritual a person because I'll tell you, I'm speaking in tongues. No, it wasn't that at all. The only, the only benefit and revelation of the example of tongue speaking was in reference to preaching the word of God so people could hear the gospel and get saved. And so... When you deal with chapter 12, chapter 13, and chapter 14, a lot of people get mixed up in these three chapters and they come out with the wrong conclusions. Uh, I would say this. Chapter 12, 1 Corinthians is a book of rebuke to the Corinthian believers. So we don't take a book of rebuke to Christians that were doing wrong and use it as a foundation of our doctrinal position. And so what we do is we take the book that he wrote here as a rebuke, find out what was being done that was wrong and make sure it's corrected in our own life. But oftentimes what people do is they take it and embrace it as this is what I need to practice. So that's all kind of a little bit of introduction there. Um, first point in the message here, verses 1 through 11. We see, first of all, right off the bat, the Apostle Paul deals with the diversity of gifts. In other words, every gift is different. In uh, verse 1 through 3, he says this, Your past experiences are to be abandoned. He says, Now concerning the spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Uh, ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away under these dumb idols. I love Paul. Every time I read that verse, I circle F. Uh, you're dumb idols. You know, can you imagine saying something? Oh, you got to be careful. Don't be offensive. Well, Paul's not worried about it. <laughs> carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now, there's going to be a debate here, instruction here, dealing with the move and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in their life. And Paul's just said on it right up front. He said, I want you to understand this. You were worshipers of idols. You had no problem with worshiping idols. 
But now when we come to this purpose or the meaning or the experience of the Holy Spirit, realize this, nobody can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Ghost. So you, you can't come along and say, oh, Jesus is Lord. And then you say, okay, well, now, now, now you've got to get the gift of tongues. You've got to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, wait a minute. Somebody cannot testify and they cannot experience the reality of Jesus Christ in their life if it was not by the revelation and conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, we don't come to our own self-determinations of who God is and what the Spirit is. They were used to it because they were used to idolatry. And they established the foundation means of all their worship and uh, um, all their supposed praise of God. And Paul's just saying this. You cannot judge or evaluate what God is doing right now or will do in the future based on your past experiences. And we have to watch out for that. And, uh, you know, we're, we're all products of the environment and the world that we live in. And many times what we do is we start to assess and evaluate what the Christian life is, what worship in church is, based on our past experiences in life. And uh, wait a minute, we're supposed to leave all of that behind. We're supposed to walk away from all of that. And I, I cannot get a proper interpretation of the scriptures based on my past experiences. I have to very clearly, surrenderedly, humbly compare scripture with scripture to make sure I come to the right conclusion. And, uh, you know, people from uh, different religious backgrounds... We all struggle with that. I, you know, I just, I just know there was a lot of things there over the years growing up in a Baptist church, uh, things that were absolutely not scriptural. And, and, uh, and over the years, I've, had to, I've really had to stop and study the thing out and say, well, wait a minute, what does the Word of God say about this? And you ha it's hard sometimes just to say, I've got to forget everything I was taught. And I've got to systematically study the Word of God. And that's what Paul said, telling him. He said, you cannot. You've got to abandon your past experiences. And uh, because you're trying to talk about spiritual things, and you're carnal. Uh, you're fleshly. And so past experiences uh, need to be abandoned. Then in verse 4 through 7, we see the present exercise is by the same authority. He says, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. So in the verse 4 there, the gifts are by the same spirit. It doesn't matter what your spiritual gift is. You're not some special individual because you have some different gift from, than from somebody else. Because the authority and the, the experience that you can have in exercising that gift that you have comes from the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. And uh, so gifts are by the same Spirit. Administrations, notice in verse 5, but there are differences of administrations but the same Lord. Administrations means the ability to manage or to operate or oversee, but it's the same Lord. In other words, you may have a gift I don't know what it can say, organizing, you know, activities in the church or whatever. Uh, and someone else may have the gift of being able to organize lesson plans and study plans and this, that, and the other. There's different administrations. There are different aspects of things that need to be created and fulfilled in the church ministry. But realize this, it is the same Lord that gives us the authority to do those things in the church within one body, within the body of Christ. And so that's Jesus Christ. He says there are many differences, but it's the same Lord. So we see the authority of the Holy Spirit in verse 4. We see the authority of Jesus Christ in verse 5. And then in verse 6, he says there are diversities of operations, 
but it is the same God which worketh all in all. And so we see the authority of the Father in verse 6. And it is God who has the authority to enable us to work out those ministrations, to work out those experiences in our life. It says the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all involved in the process of living out the gifts that God gives us. Now, they're gifts that God gives us. They're not gifts that you can earn. You may have, I, I know I've always, over the years, I've taken this spiritual assessment test to find out what your spiritual gift is. Uh, without fail, every, every test I've ever taken, I've always scored sky high on evangelism and administration. But I always bomb out on grace and on mercy. Now, I always tell people, don't come trying to find mercy from me. I just don't have any. i gotta, I got to make it work, amen? So you need to pray for me. But the reality is, it is God who has given me the gift that I have. It is God who has given me the gifts that I don't have. He's withheld them from me. Because God has a plan and a purpose to work in my life to his glory and for the profit of others. But he's done that in your life too. And so I'm glad for the diversity of the gifts that we have because it makes the church function in a positive way. And so number four there in your notes is just simply this, verse seven. Uh, every one of these gifts are fulfilled for the same purpose. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And uh, whatever it may be, uh, you may be very gracious, loving, kind, being able to help people, uh, very benevolent. That's wonderful. But God has given you that gift to be able to profit everybody in the church. Why? Because there's some that aren't merciful, some that aren't uh, administratively sound and being able to organize things. Uh, some aren't able to sing. Some, some aren't able to play instruments. Uh, but that's okay because God is the one who has gifted us to take each one of us in our gifts and our abilities to plug in together and minister together for the glory of God. And it works. It works. Where it doesn't work is we start becoming prideful in our gift. Where it doesn't work is when we refuse to live out that gift God has given us. And that's when we start having struggles. So, he, first of all, he starts off with this matter of past experience to be abandoned. Present ex exercise is by authority. And that authority is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 8, he starts to deal with the spiritual gifts evaluated. He starts to define what they are and how they work in our lives. Notice in verse 8, it says, For the one is given the Spirit, uh, I'm sorry, for one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. And so you fill in there, it's just simply wisdom. It means here just intellect, in, intellect, uh, intelligence. Uh, understanding and skill imparting Christian truth. Um, I remember years ago, when there was a young fellow who was going out to start a church, and he took a church, and he pastored several different churches. And I remember my pastor was, was blunt with him, and he just told him, he said, Brother, you know, I love you to death. He said, but you just do not have the ability to pastor a church. I mean, he ruined like three or four churches. He just did not have the ability to operate and run a church, preach in a manner that would people would come to an understanding of the scriptures. What was the problem? His, he did not have the spirit of wisdom. He did, he did not understand what needed to be done and how to impart those Christian truths to the hearts of people. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, there's... It's okay not to be able to have that ability. Uh, I do. I look at a lot of preachers around the world, and I, you know, I, there's different preachers I listen to on the internet or whatever, and I've listened to their preaching tapes. I look at their ministries, and I see some of them. Man, their ministries are huge. I mean, huge. 
And I remember I got out of Bible college. I said, well, I know this. I'm going to go out and start a church, and it's going to be running 1,500 people in five years. And I'll tell you one thing. It'll be an amazing ministry. And, and you know what? That ain't never happened. And, uh, and I look at these different ministries, and I look at it, and I say, I'm glad they had that church. Because if I had that thing, I'd mess it up. I can't, I can't do that. I can't deal with that. It's too, it's too big. It's too beyond big. I know what my limitations are. And, and, but, but that's okay. That's okay because not everybody's called or given the spirit to be able to do that type of ministry. So why don't we just not be angry about it and jealous about it and just rejoice in the Lord has gifted us to do what he is opening up the doors for us to do. And so wisdom, I need wisdom. You need wisdom. And God will give us wisdom. You know, James 1 says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth all men liberally and upbraideth not. I do know this, that where I'm lacking in my life, I can go to the Lord in prayer and ask for wisdom. And God will give me a spirit of wisdom about situations and how to deal with things. So it's a spiritual gift. But not only wisdom, but he goes on here and says, and to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit. The word of knowledge here means deeper understanding of Christian principles. You know, I, I get tickled sometimes with these uh, charismatics. Because they go along, oh, God gave me a word of knowledge. Well, he did me too. I've got a whole lot of word of knowledge here, amen. And I, I, just, I just know this. If you will sincerely ask the Lord to reveal to you what his word says when you read it, he'll give you a word of knowledge. Okay. He'll help you to understand it. And I, I, don't, I don't believe this is a supernatural thing that comes on somebody, but God won't give it to someone else in an understanding heart. Are there people who cannot comprehend as much as you? I'm sure there are. I mean, there's people, there's preachers I call when I need counsel about how to do ministry or how to live my Christian life. I call them, and they have insight that I don't have. And that's okay. And uh, realize this, is if every one of us will ask God to give us a spirit of knowledge, he'll give us an understanding heart to where we can minister to one another. And so knowledge is a deeper understanding of Christian. Christian principles. Then there was faith. He says to another faith by the same spirit. Faith is just simply conviction of truth, especially in respect to man's relationship with God. And uh, faith, I need the Lord to increase my faith. I, I'm always asking God, give me faith. Uh, we, we, you know, we just had a meeting. We're talking about trying to add on to the building and see what we can do to expand our opportunities to be able to minister through the school and in our church and all that. And I'll tell you one thing. I've been praying the Lord, God, give me wisdom. I have no idea what I'm doing. I need wisdom. I need knowledge. And I need faith. I need to believe that God can do the impossible. And I'm going to tell you, that faith to believe that God can do the impossible is a gift that God gives us. And you say, well, why is it a gift? Because there's people I've seen over the years that absolutely have no faith at all. And things just, something happens in their life and they fall apart. Then you look at somebody else that has all kinds of tragedies and difficulties in, his, in their life. And they're just loving God, and they're worshiping the Lord, and they're just telling people about Jesus. You say, how in the world can they do that? Because they have a spirit of faith that I believe God gives them to enable them to, to have a greater, deeper relationship uh, with their God. Then healing. He says to another healing. A healing just simply means to cure. The root uh, Greek word is in the middle voice which means the subject partakes in the action. You know, so the gift of healing is to be able to believe God and that God will, your faith you have, God will bring healing in your heart. I don't believe it's talking about faith healers, but I think it is talking about healing by faith. 
Uh, James said, is there any sick among you? Let him call the elders of the church. Anoint him with oil. And he says this, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And so God gives us a spirit of healing. I've seen people, I've listen, I've prayed with people over the years at different times. We don't have a healing service here, but I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, can you pray with me? Can you and the deacons anoint me with oil and pray? I said, yes, we can. We can go in my office and we'll pray. And I'll tell you, we've seen people uh, get healed over that. Are we divine healers? Absolutely not. But somebody had faith enough to believe that God would heal and God honored our prayers. And so he gave us a gift of healing. And I know this, that God can still heal, but I don't believe in any of these. I, you know, what was it? Oral Roberts, always, he always tickled me. He always said he had the gift of healing. Now my question is, if that's true, then why didn't you build a hospital? You know, I mean, you contradict yourself with your actions. And so, healing. Then he says, uh, miracles. Another working of miracles. And uh, the word miracles is, just means an inherent power. The word miracle there is the Greek word dunamis. Uh, that we get the, our word dynamite from. And uh, so, God gives us a spiritual gift of being able to do miracles. In other words, God has the power that can be released through us that absolutely does the impossible. And uh, God, God can do that. Then prophecy. Uh, and to another uh, prophecy. Prophecy means uh, speaking forth of divine, by divine inspiration of things to come. We had the Old Testament prophets that spoke of things that were coming in the New Testament that no one had any idea how that was going to come to pass. But it came to pass, and so you and I, in the New Testament, we can prophesy, I preach on Bible prophecy, I can prophesy about the future because of the fact the Bible gives us information about the future. Uh, I believe the Bible is complete, and because it's complete, there are no divine, new divine revelations. And uh, the revelations that we receive uh, to be able to prophesy about the future has to line up with Scripture. And so we have that foundation there. Then we have discerning spirits. Uh, to another, he gives discerning spirits. It means the ability to distinguish between or judge. Yeah, I think one of the problems in the church today, and I see this, my wife and I have often talked about that, there is a, a developing lack of discernment among believers. And I think if there's a spiritual gift we ought to be praying for and asking God uh, to move in our hearts is that he would give us a discerning of the spirits. Uh, because, you know, we have to try the spirit. And uh, because there's many spirit, false antichrists, false of spirits that are out in the world and we need to know uh, how to discern them and judge what is right and what is wrong. And some people have a greater gift on that than someone else. I've had, listen, I've had people over the years come to me and say, you know, Pastor, I've already been praying, and I, I think you need to be careful about so-and-so. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, okay, all right. I just kind of take it with a grain of salt and give it to the Lord, and the next thing you know, i got trouble with so-and-so. And I thought, how did that person know that? And there's some people just have a discerning heart about situations and individuals. That comes from God. And I'm not talking about gossip. I'm going to be dealing with gossip coming up in this, I don't know, with this lesson or the next one. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about literally having a spirit in us that discerns that there is a situation that we need to watch out for. And so discerning of spirits. Then uh, he goes on and tells us uh, that there are those that to another diverse kinds of tongues. Kinds of tongues. Uh, the interesting thing is this. Kind is the Greek word genos. Tongues is the Greek word glossia. Genos means kindred or family or tribe or nation. 
And so he says he's giving individuals different kinds. He's saying different family, different background, different national language. Because glossia means speech or language of an individual. So when he says he gives to another diverse kinds of tongues, he's saying a language that that person does not know and does not speak, God's going to give them supernaturally the ability to speak in that language. Glossia, tongues is nothing more than speech. It's like, it's, it is not a supernatural gibberish. And then he says the interpretation. The word, and he said to another interpretation of tongues. That means... Uh, you're able to explain what was spoken. And when Peter stood up on Pentecost, he preached in tongues, and everybody heard him speak in their own language. So there was no need to interpret. Uh, my wife, who does sign language, you know, I preach, whose people get up here and sing. Uh, the deaf cannot hear, so what does she do? She interprets what's being said, what is going on. Uh, that's a gift. Over the years, I've tried to start learning uh, sign language, and my fingers don't work good on that stuff. And I'm glad that God gave my wife a gift to it. In Bible college, she, you know, a friend of hers was going to go to the sign language class, and she wasn't planning on going. She didn't want to go, and she, her friend said, will you go with me? I don't want to go by myself. And she said, I don't want to learn that. She said, and she ends up going with her, and she ends up staying in the class and just really grows in that area, starts interpreting in the church, and, and has been doing it ever since we've been in ministry. Now, I believe that's a gift, the gift to be able to interpret. Uh, there's others that are bilingual, and they can interpret what you're saying to someone else. And so interpretation. God can supernaturally give us the ability to interpret a language. But it's not a gibberish, it's an audible language. Then uh, number 10 there, and according to verse 11, but all these worketh at one and the self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So all is according to God's will, not man's desire. So I remember when I was in Bible college at a bus route, we had one of the little girls that came on our bus, I don't think she was in fifth grade, sixth grade, around that bracket. All of a sudden, she wasn't on the bus anymore. And uh, we would go by and visit her and said, you, you, what are you doing? And one day I told her, I said, what are you doing? You were faithful on the bus, and now you're not on the bus. Oh, I'm going over to this other church. And I was like, why are you going over to that other church? Oh, they're teaching me how to speak in tongues. Yep. Oh, wait, wait a minute. I thought this was a spiritual gift. I thought this was something that God gave to individuals according to his will. Amen. And I think we need to be reminded sometimes that the spiritual gifts that we have and we possess is not by the desire of man. It is by the will of God. And so diversity of gifts. Well, that's a good kickoff start. We'll have to continue that next week. And uh, chapter 12, 13, and 14 are great chapters. I love going through and studying them. I know that will be a blessing for you as we continue to study because a lot of people have questions about these issues, especially the tongue issues. So hopefully I'll be able to give you some information that will be a help. Well, we need to pray tonight. I, I got a text from uh, Bob Gray out in uh, uh, Gettysburg. And so his cancer has flared up again. His wife Pam is home, but she's on oxygen. She's not really doing very well. He's starting chemo tomorrow. Uh, he's supposed to do, I don't know, he said six or eight hours tomorrow and do chemo on Friday also. Uh, but if you can remember him, Bob Gray, Pastor Bob Gray, and his wife Pam, uh, that would be a blessing. Anything else we need to add to the prayer sheet? Tom? Uh, my sister uh, Kathleen McLaughlin, uh, she has neuralgia of the the jaw, and she cannot walk, and she mumbles, and she can't put anything together. Okay. So, you know, this is a perfect subject. Yeah. Healing. Amen. And, uh, and one thing I got to say on the, on the tongues, I was in a Pentecostal church when I left the, I, the, the 
Catholic church. Right. And there was a little girl, 15 years old, up at that, they had a altar call. And the, the, this pastor, cool pastor, come up and said, do you want to speak in tongues? And she said, no. He said, don't you want to be like everybody else? Right. And that, that set alarm to me, get mm -hmm. the heck out of here. Yep. And that's it. Yeah. They're, they're weird, they're, they're off the wall. And because that's a philosophy that, that pushes that, is that's a sign of spirituality if you speak in tongues. All right, we'll pray for Tom's sister, Kathleen, and uh, ask God to, to hear her jaw, and so she'll be able to speak clearly. Amen. Thank you. Yes, uh, Jack. Uh, I'm going to have a procedure Monday for some skin cancer. So okay. All goes well. Okay, so pray for Jack. <coughs> uh, procedure on Monday. All right, and skin cancer. All right, anything else we need to pray for? Don't leave anybody out. All right, yeah, Tony. You know, tomorrow I've been listening, I listen to the bridge. It's the only thing that's on my truck every day. And tomorrow's the uh, National Day of Prayer. Okay. And, uh, you know, I think maybe we have to pray for the people that only pray on one day. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, you know, it's like celebrating something for one day. It's like, you yeah. know. Try to, try to keep it in your life, you know, every day. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's great to be able to have a national recognition that we need to pray, but uh, God's people need to be praying every day and encouraging others to pray. But let's pray tomorrow. Let's take time to pray uh, that God will move and God will bless. We need the Lord uh, to intervene. Anything else? I think we got everybody? All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Be sure to be praying for this Sunday coming up. A uh, good letter in here from Paul Harrigan down in Haiti. Make sure you read through that. Be praying for him. He's been down there in Haiti a long time. The church has been supporting him uh, ever since before I got here. So uh, he's been a faithful man. Be sure to pray for him and his family. Pray for this Sunday, Mother's Day, and uh, that uh, we'll see somebody get saved. Amen. So God bless you for being here tonight.